and welcome to yet another Let's Talk episode. I am joined here by Dan. Hey there, Dan. How are you? Hey there, buddy man. How are you doing? Life is great and wonderful. Just uh, finished a kick-ass exercise, full nice. of energy, full of enthusiasm, full of life, ready to tackle all the freaking challenges ahead. Ooh, yeah. Let's go for it. Amazing. I like your energy. I like the, uh, the attitude you bring to the show. Uh, it's amazing. It's my pleasure. Mm, yeah. And uh, so today we're going to talk about... Um, as as a sort of like a you know follow up to our um, back to school um, episode that we had a while ago, uh, we're gonna have uh, a um, an episode on learning, how to learn, techniques of learning that we basically both use in our lives, um, and yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go from there. So initially, I want to talk about basically the idea of learning. What is the idea of learning for you? What do you consider learning? Do you have to go to school to learn or or reading a book is considered. So, for example, for me, reading a book is also considered learning, even That's if it's right. even if it's a novel. It doesn't matter whatever it is. In all honesty, every single moment of my life is considered learning. So I'm um, very uh, conscious like that. But then I'll talk. We'll talk about that in, in details later. What is the idea of learning for you? Well, you know, you already gave a very great definition here. But let me just give you my own definition, which is much more general and, of course, scientific in nature. Right. Let's take uh, neuro neurology, for example, mm -hmm. right? Neuroscience, we say learning occurs when two neurons with two separate information right. develop some synapses among each other. This means anytime you receive a new piece of information and then you link that piece of information to an already uh, basically mastered information, then you are learning something new. So learning is a very general thing. And it's not at all about going to school or even reading books. You could be totally illiterate, but learn a lot of skills like jumping, running, I don't know, a lot of Precisely. athletic skills. So learning itself is a very, it's not just, first of all, it's not a human function. It exists also in animals. For sure. And learning simply means you link two pieces of information, one newly acquired and one already in your possession, and you create synapses among the two, and you create this link, and that's called mm -hmm. learning. So learning is a very general concept, and everyone in this world, so long as you're alive, you're learning. Let's be honest. So long as you're alive, you are learning. So the question is not whether or not you're learning, because we all are learning every single day. I mean, we are. I heard that our sensors are being bombarded by millions and millions of pieces of information every single day, so we're always learning. The question is not whether or not we are learning. The question is, are we learning the things that will help us live a good and happy life? Or are we just learning this crap that has no benefit whatsoever? And of course, usually the good stuff usually come from uh, books and educational courses. And the shitty stuff comes from everywhere. Literally, just look around you. You see a lot of useless information that will not in any way add up to your lifestyle or make you a happier or more successful person. Yeah, that's that. That's actually a very good answer, and I liked it a lot. Uh, you you sort of blown me away in a sense that you mentioned we're we're learning. The the question is whether we're learning the right things. <laughs> so so yeah, it, it is true, and I agree with that. Um, uh, as as a living organism, every one of us we're learning. Even even the the smallest of organisms are are learning in a different capacity, exactly. of course. But um, it's happening. It's a it's a dynamic that happens. And neurologically speaking, at least, um, and and you're right uh, that that affects our judgment, that, that affects our uh, worldview, and lots of other things, of course, and skills, etc. So, um, yeah, well, what happens here is that we we want to feed the right stuff to our exactly. learning procedure. Yeah. So so that, in my opinion, becomes very important. Uh, and very, which makes me very selective. You've talked about it multiple times, not necessarily on this podcast, on many different platforms. I remember that you were talking about how you are very specific on who you hang out with or uh, what exactly. books you read or what music you, know, you listen to. Most of learning is on a subconscious level, by the way. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Like when I first realized that the majority of learning is done subconsciously, I was baffled. I was shocked. Like, oh my goodness. And because of this, because we're learning 24-7, even in sleep, dude, even in sleep, we're learning. Our brain is creating right. synapses. Like uh, that day's memory and events are being formed in their subconscious mind to create new learning material for the future. So we are learning 24-7. Tick tock, tick tock. You're learning, buddy. Every second. The question is, are you learning the things that are getting you ahead in life or they're keeping you back? That's the matter. And unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, 
the majority of the things that we're learning in the world are negative, are not, are, are dispiriting. You, you do not get motivation from them, no energy, no zest, and more importantly, it makes you average. So ultimately, we are always learning, and we are always learning on a subconscious level, and it's always best to focus your attention on learning the good stuff. Very true, and um, that, that's, that's actually true, that our, our unconscious capacity, uh, which is also... Um, in different contexts, well, in, in context of cognition, it's called rapid cognition, meaning you're unconsciously uh, are grabbing information from your environment and, and deciding what they mean. Uh, for example, you, you look at somebody and you immediately feel like, I, I don't like this guy. This guy looks like, um, and you don't, you don't have a conscious reason. It, it's not because he's, he's wearing, for example, a, a gun or something, or he threatens you or something. You just have a gut feeling. You say, I can't explain it. I just don't like this guy or something like that. That's, there's also what, what is called rapid cognition, which means, um, it, it's unconscious and it's very quick. You grasp a few information of the information thrown at, at you from that guy. And then you, you make a judgment based on your pre pre previous experiences or, or, or the, the things that your neurons learn already. So yeah, that's very true. And, uh, and in by the way, for those of our listeners who might be interested in this concept, there's a great book called Blank oh, uh, by Malcolm Gladwell about this very subject that can really go into details about how we can engage in rapid, uh, basically, cognition and how to uh, understand and judge things uh, quickly using our subconscious power. Yeah, it's a very really great book. Um, in general, I really like Malcolm Gladwell uh, and uh, this book. And spe specifically, it's very good for this purpose. Uh, Blink is literally about that blink of an eye and deciding on on that rapid cognition. Exactly. Um, so, so yeah, it's a um, it's a uh, it's a very good book. Definitely go for go for it. Anyhow, so so yeah, our unconscious capacity is actually um, like much much more. Um, um, bigger and more capable than our conscious uh, capacity in our brain so so yeah it's uh, as you mentioned when you were when you're you think you're watching a uh, harmless you know tv show or something it's not really harmless you're grasping the ideas you you might start acting like the characters that you like in that movie you might very subtly you might not even notice it yourself your surround surrounding people might not but then I'm trying to say how much influence it can actually have. Or it could be actually Personal very, stuff. very, very direct and everybody, even yourself, might notice it. Uh, you might start wearing dresses and, you know, uh, adopt their fashion style. You, you, there, lots of things can happen. So Everything. Buddy. Your entire personality and identity can shift as a result of what you're on a consistent basis, allowing your brain to consume right. and to go through. Like, it, it, by the way, it takes time. It does not happen overnight. That yeah, is sure. why I mentioned earlier that there are two ways to change yourself in my recent post on social media. One is by inspiration. Like, mm -hmm. so you suddenly feel a sense of inspiration and like, I want to change right now. And secondly, it's about being around the, the people with a higher game. And usually the first doesn't last because ultimately lasting changes require constant repetition. Which is right. why I'm a huge fan of repetition. You see, we're living in a world where people are always bored. They want to try one thing and try something else. But I'm not like that at all. I like to repeat things. I like to constantly go through the repetition process because that's what leads to conditioning. And that's also a critical component of learning, which we're going to talk about earlier, uh, later in the podcast. Exactly. And I was exactly going to go to that in the very next. So I'm going to talk about uh, what well, we started off neurologically, but it's a good good way to approach it because, well, well whatever you perceive is neurological. So, um, so yeah, it, as you mentioned, like the, the, the repetition is a brick and bone of um, uh, uh, learning, like the structure that your neurons shape for a very specific task that they learn or, uh, learn or a skill that they learn uh, is reinforced through repetition. So when they get affirmation that this works, they, they make it stronger and stronger and stronger. Sometimes this is the wrong thing. So think about it. You want to get out of your bed and go to gym. You've been used to going to bed for far too long. The very first time is going to be the hardest. But that's the exactly. time that you, actually that's not the that's not true. The second time is the hardest. The very first time you have motivation. The second time you might not. <laughs> um, but the point so, is you have to. Sometimes you want to go to bed, buddy, but you can't because somebody next to you just doesn't let you, right? Well, that's also true. You never yeah, know. Yeah, buddy. Never sometimes know. that happens. <laughs> like, uh, come on, I'm just tired. Now, okay, one more time. Let's go it's for like, it. No <laughs> very true. Yeah, that's true. It's, uh, so that's that's the point. Like, um, you know, when you want to make a lasting change, you can't do it just once, especially if in that. Room 
realm, you have a, a predefined uh, neurological state, meaning it's a skill that you learn it the wrong way, say, or the way that is not uh, desired. Now you want to change that. It's going to be much difficult, much more difficult than when you're introducing yourself to a blank new situation, which you you're, you don't have any um, uh, resistance towards it. So yeah, repetition is super important, and but the but is here uh, is a question for you basically. But it's super hard. How do you deal with it? With this hard. Well, time? first of all, uh, about this whole class of repetition. You see, repetition, as as they say, it's uh, the breakfast for champions. So it's a necessity in all forms of learning. But here's the interesting fact: not all of us learn the same way. I mean, that's one of the major problems with the schooling system, especially the K-12 system, where people yeah. just are crammed in this classroom. They all do the same thing. You see, learning is done differently. There's not just one type. I mean, sitting down reading books, that's one type of learning. But there are many other types of learning. Generally speaking, there are, you, based upon the research that is done in this field, there are three major types of learners. Technically, there's four, which is a combination, but I'm going I'm to stick with these three major categories. Number one, those learners who are predominantly auditory, those who are predominantly visual, and those who are predominantly uh, kinesthetic. That is, they learn using activity, physical movement, motions. Let me just explain a little bit what all uh, these three mean one by one. However, in reality, generally, most of us are a combination of these three. That of is, course. it's rare to find somebody who just learns entirely auditorily and one just entirely kinesthetically. So we usually have a mixture of those. But in every single one of us, one of these three is the dominant form of learning. And it all comes down to our genetics and the makeup of our brain because we all have different brains. For example, introverted people, uh, their brains are formed in a way where it requires a lot less stimulation to work properly. As a matter of fact, if you have the brain of an introvert, when it receives too much stimulation, it actually experiences a lot of stress. That is why, for example, introverts don't really enjoy ups and downs in their lives very much. They like things to be stable. On the other hand, if you're an extrovert, usually you want to have a lot of stimulation. Why? Because your very brain requires more stimulation to work properly. And if there's not enough stimulation, you will actually experience stress. So these three depends entirely on your biology and your overall genetic makeup. And what are these three? The auditory uh, style of learning is for those people for whom the primary form of learning is through audio, that is listening and speaking. Ironically, uh, this uh, style of learning is actually not that common, but usually it's quite effective. The uh, second type, it's the visual type. The visual type is what we generally see a lot in a typical schooling system, and it is done primarily via books and seminars and uh, lectures and whatnot, what's on the board. So visual learners learn best by reading, by seeing images, watching videos, and using their uh, vision to uh, take in the information. And the third type is the kinesthetic type of learners. These are the learners who need to learn through action. For example, if you are, let's say you want to read a book. So I'm just going to ask you right now, uh, okay. basically, uh, Pujic. We have three types of learners, and all three are supposed to read a book or read, a, let's say, read a course for their exams. One of them is auditory, one is visual, and one is uh, basically kinesthetic. First of all, who here is at an advantage? For reading a book? That's right. A visual. Obviously. So right. that, that uh, gentleman or lady is at an advantage here. But what right. do you recommend the other two to do in this case to read that book? So if I'm uh, if I'm an auditory person, I would listen to the audiobook for uh, is that fantastic. This is what I do all the time because by the way, I'm I'm an auditory I'm a predominantly auditory learner, mm -hmm. and I'm then uh, my second skill is actually visual, and then it's uh, kinesthetic. So for auditory learners, we prefer audio books. For so if they're reading a book, then simultaneously listen to the audiobook of the same book. This is like the ideal case because it now is you're learning the book through, uh, through your visual senses. You're reading it, but simultaneously you're hearing that as well. And what do you recommend the kinesthetic guy to do while reading that book? Um, I'm not too sure if that works. It, it works for me sometimes because I sort of am a kinesthetic, uh, maybe the second one. But um, so, so, for example, whenever I'm studying and I have a hard time grasping a concept, I start walking and explaining it to Very myself. good. Yeah. Fantastic. So a, a learner who is kinesthetic in nature – you should pr probably walk while reading the book and mm -hmm. do interactive things with the book. 
So things right. like, uh, for example, trying to highlight certain key phrases, right, right, right. trying to play, write, uh, or for example, uh, doodle, or do certain things that are active in nature and make the entire process interactive. This will allow you to make the most of your learning. And you right. earlier mentioned, so how do you repeat? Well, if you really want to repeat, then you want to make sure that, first of all, your learning is efficient. Because if you're repeating at 10% capacity, for example, I'm a predominantly auditory learner. So if you put me in a library for two hours, after two hours, I'm either sleeping or I'm doing something <laughs> dirty behind the, behind the shelf somewhere. It's like, what are you doing, Daniel? This is a fucking library or something, right? Yeah. Because I have this dominant, uh, basically, take of auditory and also kinesthetic because I like to be physically active. I mean, you see my energy level and that kind of stuff. So if you put me in that library and say, dude, two hours every day you're reading that silent library, of course – I'm repeating that process, but at a very low efficiency rate. So I will fall behind. So before you decide to commit to repetition, first discover your ideal style of learning. For me personally, the ideal style of learning is a combination of three with a focus on auditory. And of course, there should be some kinesthetic of elements like interactivity and dialogues. And of course, there's a visual element as well. But the main thing is auditory. So I learn much better through discourses and discussions, talking, chatting. Uh, than I do. I also do the same thing in writing. When I'm writing certain things, I prefer to write while, uh, for, for example, I'm saying that out loud. Uh, let's say I'm recording myself. These things are a lot better. Right. Now, if you are predominantly a visual learner or a cosmetic learner, you want to actually first discover what style of learning has the highest return on investment because not all learnings are equal. If you put me in a library that is very silent for two hours every day for one year versus somebody who is an introvert, who enjoys being in silence, who can read in silence for hours, then that guy has a huge advantage over me and his repetition will have a far ret a bigger return on investment. Mm -hmm. So that's the, uh, the first step. And once you've found the ideal style, then it is not really that difficult to repeat it. But of course, repetition always comes down to your psychology. Things like discipline, things like uh, willpower and commitment to your goal, all of these things coupled with motivation, can actually help you to repeat this process. But ultimately, if you find the ideal way, the most efficient way of learning, then repetition should not be a problem if that goal is very serious for you. Uh, that's a very good advice. And I agree with you that um, I, I don't think we do consider that people learn differently, um, especially in traditional schooling systems, um, which is unfortunate. Thankfully, it, it has started to change a little bit. I can see it here and there sometimes. Not good enough for the 21st century, but it's, it's a start. So so I'm happy about that. Um, the fact, and, and most importantly, the fact that people learn that they learn differently is important because, as you mentioned, they can optimize on, okay, which one should I use? Which one should I not use? Um, and what do I do if I'm stuck in this situation or et cetera? Anyhow, so uh, moving past that, yeah, that's, that's very great. And um, I personally... Uh, as an avenue of learning, I really do like to consume books. Um, one of the reasons is that I'm basically, I know it sounds geeky, but I, I put it this way because it makes a lot of sense to me, uh, is ba I'm basically downloading a portion of a person's consciousness being the writer. So wow, so, that yeah. was the geekiest way to describe <laughs> reading a book, man. That was like super, like nerdy twenty nineteen. Just literally, that was the best thing ever. I loved it. We're not that in twenty nineteen cool. yet. Let's go for a going. virtual high five here. A virtual high five. Virtual high five. Cool. Got it. There you go. Fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. Um. So, so that's the thing. Like, what I mean by that is that the, the person who wrote the book has gone through his his or her own life, learning lots of things, and trying to organize and manage that a portion of those and throw it in the book in forms of writing or audiobooks or whatever. And then I get to buy that and basically start adopting. Like it's not a direct download because I can't literally put every structure that she created in my own brain. What I do instead is that I match it with my own existing uh, learning system. So I basically sort of select parts of it and adapt it to my system. Which you know, you gave a very geeky definition of this one, which I loved. And I'm going to give you the old school definition, sure, sure. which I learned a long time ago from Brian Tracy. He said, in life, there are two ways to learn things. Mm -hmm. You can pay the full price for that learning right. or you can borrow that learning. Exactly. And when you're reading a book, 
you're borrowing it. You're not paying full price. The author okay. who has to go through all the research and life experience, he has to pay the full price. Sometimes years, sometimes decades, sometimes his or her entire life. Yeah. Whereas for the reader, we get to experience all of that in a few hours of sit reading or maximum. Like, I mean, think of like the audiobooks on average. The average length of an audiobook uh, is about uh, less than 10 hours. And the longest one usually uh, run less than 17 or 18 hours. So you literally can, at, in the worst case scenario, think of the longest book that is the most boring you could possibly imagine. It will rarely be less than 24 hours. So you literally can uh, get that. I mean, let's go back on the geeky part. You right. can literally uh, compress all of that learning in one day, yeah. in t- less than 24 hours. And that's really incredible when it comes to efficiency and uh, because ultimately knowledge is potential power. Some say knowledge yeah. is power. I disagree with that. Knowledge is not power. Right. Knowledge is potential power. For sure. And of course, we all love to have more potential powers because then if you take uh, action with it, then you can actually acquire real power. So ultimately, that's a very, very important thing to focus on for me as well. Reading, uh, basically, of course, I focus more on the audiobooks. Right. I do read a lot, Same of course, idea. but when I'm reading out, if I don't have access to basically the audio, because you know, one of my most favorite ways of reading a book is that actually I pay twice for the book. I know it's a bit more expensive, but it's totally worth it. So I buy the original book, and I also pay for the audio version of the oh, same this book. this is what it's I do too sometimes. Audio. Yes, it's, it's really incredible, actually. Yes, I do this especially uh, in foreign languages because I want to improve my pronunciation and right. stuff like this. So I did this recently with a couple of Russian books. And uh, so I, I buy the original book and I buy the audio book and then I read and listen simultaneously. It's just a blast, man, because I'm literally uh, I'm running at full speed here when I'm reading like this. I mean, okay. the audio is taken in the audio. And of course, I'm uh, reading a book at the same time. It's really good in that regard. You have so zero chance of distractions. I love the books. What's that? You have zero chance of distractions. You're not giving any exactly, room man. for like, errors. Exactly, man. I especially use like these headsets and whatnot. So yeah. like I'm freaking zoomed in. Like it's pretty good. I love it. It's amazing. Yeah, I uh, I I have, I have started to do that. I've done it with two books already. Um, obviously, it's much more expensive. So it's not it, it's not like I can do it with every single book unless I'm just reading a book a year. <laughs> uh, exactly. Not. So, so right. but but it but for the books that I uh, appreciate or. Um, I do that sometimes. I get so the first one that happened uh, was um, what was the name of the book? Uh, God, by Mac Conga, Outlier. Um, Outlier, yeah. very nice. So, so I, I actually listened to the audio book. I was like, you know what? I'm I'm getting this book, like physical book too. So I got it, and I'm actually wow. happy that I did. So I, I did it again, like re-listened and re-read the book like at the same simultaneously. Nice. Yeah. So, so one of the interesting ways for me is predominantly. Uh, this is what I call active learning, meaning that you actively are engaging in learning. Another thing that I like to do is to passive uh, to initiate a passive learning system. And what I designed for myself is basically uh, derived from um, physics first principles. Physics first principles, for those who don't know, essentially says there are very few, like there, there are certain brick bone that we know is true. And there are very small components that make up the bigger components. So, so for example, you, I'll, I'll give you a very uh, simple example. You go on a date, it doesn't work out, okay? So the reason you might think is that, okay, did I take her to the wrong place? Did I, you know, did I talk too much or whatever? Every single one of these can be broken down to very small pieces. You have wow. to find those small pieces and fix those. And those are the ones that are actually very true. Other ones are inter- uh, interpretation because they are the sum of the very fe- very small, right? So so what you do, you go and fix the, the, the foundations, the bricks and bones, the little things that are very true in nature. They're binary. They can't be interpreted. They're either there or not there. They're either true or not true. So it's it's very easy to decide on them. Whereas like uh, the, the the bigger stuff, it comes down to our interpretation of them. So the, exactly. there's the idea of, okay, I think this is right. You think this is wrong. Who's right here? Right. So and and that becomes very subjective. But when you break it down to the small little pieces, they're true in nature and they're completely objective. You can't really make a mistake. So what I was going with this was I like to do um, a passive learning in a system. Okay, something goes wrong in my life. I don't get a job interview. I don't get the job. I don't don't know. I don't go on a date. Um, I don't know. I'm late to work. Simple stuff. It doesn't have to be sophisticated. What happened? What went wrong? And I like at the end of my day, I like to 
sit down, think about it, bring it a piece of paper if you have to, or I like to at least, and actually uh, draw sort of like a diagram or start start connecting the dots, simply put. That's right. So that's, I, I know it becomes active at some point, but it's passive in a sense that I don't have to do anything but live and then analyze my living. That's it. Well, of course, that's called learning predominantly through trial and error. And I'm a huge fan of it. And I believe that you cannot do without it. It doesn't matter how much information you get from your mentors or books or seminars or whatnot. Ultimately, you got it's kind of like learning how to drive a car. You can read books all about it all the time. You can listen to it. You can watch it. But in the end, you got to do it yourself. So that's true. I'm all for taking actions. But if you want to learn everything through trial and oh, error, no, that, then that's of not course, possible. it's not very efficient. No, no, no. So I like to combine both. Exactly. I like to combine both the trial and error because let's be honest, I really believe that we are all going to fail our way to success. Every single one of us, no matter how smart we are or how dumb we are or how young or how old or how tall or short, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. We all have to fail our way to success. This means Very we true. are going to inevitably have to do a lot of trials and errors. That's just inevitable. However, this process can be made a lot more efficient if we also do what we call finding a mentor and trying that to was the third way I was gonna help of a mentor. This will accelerate learning because I'm a huge fan of learning with the help of mentors, because this not only makes the process more fun, but also it takes a lot of the negative emotions and uncertainty out of learning. Because a mentor has done this for 7, 10, 20, 30 years, and that level of certainty and confidence that comes with that many years of pursuing yourself in one career or whatnot can really help you to gain the confidence necessary to perform well in a new task and to learn at a higher speed. So generally, I like both approaches when yeah. it comes to learning and with you cannot do without the other right? I mean, you can't just be a parrot and like a yes sir kind of a mentee and do whatever the mentor asks you to do you need to have initiative but ultimately combining both will give you the most efficient approach to learning yeah very true and so the, the two of them are very good as you mentioned so we have the um you know uh trial and error and we have the consumption of somebody else's trial and error results which is books or uh, blogs or whatever podcasts or whatever um uh, and w thirdly we have the idea of mentors which i was going to go to um so as you mentioned i'm a big fan of mentors Th they can be uh, again this is another active passive situation on the part of mentor so active meaning that you have a mentor that you literally physically talk to get get personal feedbacks on etc cetera, etc cetera. and then you have also types of mentors that they don't know you you just know them uh, public figures or whatever so for example brian tracy i believe it's one of your mentors but he doesn't even know you exist <laughs> so, exactly but that's Let's fine be honest. that's 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 completely fine uh or he or or does he who knows? Anyhow, my point is, uh, you're not interacting directly with them necessarily. Yeah, like they're very not. Good point, very yeah. Good point. So, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of both. Whatever you can get your hands on, it's, it's very good. Um, and actually, I heard from uh, basically uh, Grant Cardin, who said uh, he has never met any single one of his mentors in person. Never, ever, not a single amazing. one of them. So yes. mentorship. Well, uh, with that being said, of course, I'm, I'm a fan of direct mentorship as well because sure. it's a lot more effective. And fortunately, in my case, I have had the chance to see a lot of my mentors in person and to work with them for a long time. But generally speaking, you do not have to meet your mentors in person. You can just – uh, uh, Pujis mentioned, and I'm going to quote here in a very fancy way. You can download their knowledge into your <laughs> consciousness. I mean, that's much cooler, man. You can do that as well. That's true. That, that, that's the thing that you can do through their books, through their seminars, um, podcasts, anything really. It's, it's literally an information processed by them, put out there in, in terms of words or whatever or slides. Um, and you get to appreciate that and uh, uh, get your own take on it. Um, so, so yeah, mentors are very good um, and perhaps necessary. I don't know about that, but I think it is. Um, and beyond the process of learning. Okay, so, so um, what I'm trying to say here is that we go through this process, right? So we start off learning different ways. We read books. We, um, you know... Uh, do, do make mistakes and learn from them we have mentors we they lead us what is the end game why are we why are we even doing this uh, exactly the point you see you know let's be honest there, from my perspective there are three major reasons to learn 
Number one, the very process of learning itself, since it's an active process and it's very stimulating, is what we call uh, in psychology an autotelic experience. Now, mm -hmm. the term autotelic experience was first used in the book Flow by Dr. Uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, Mihai, uh, who is a Hungarian-American uh, psychologist who right. uh, dubbed the term autotelic. Now, autotelic experiences are dubbed experiences that generate flow, the mm -hmm. state where you are fully absorbed in the task and really enjoy it, which becomes uh, basically a goal by itself. It becomes an end in itself, and it allows you to enjoy the process. So number one, learning just anything. That's why people love traveling, for example, because when you're traveling, why right. do you think traveling is so popular? Because traveling is learning auditorily, visually, and kinesthetically all at the same time, the same time which is yeah. why it's, it's globally popular. When you find yourself in a foreign environment, all of your senses are receiving new information. Again, this, of course, depends on how you travel. We've already had an episode about traveling. If yeah. you're traveling with 50 uh, tour members, then no, of course not. You will not have that much of learning. It's just going to be a little bit of a simulation. But imagine you travel alone to a new country. Dude, Backpacking all of your senses are being bombarded by new information that you don't even know what the hell. The food, the culture, the yeah. language, the dresses, the style. I don't know, whatever. And this actually allows you to learn at a very interesting rate. So number one, people should remember that learning itself is an auditory experience. It's enjoyable by itself. That's yeah. one reason. Number two, learning could also be done for the sake of achieving certain results. Let's say you want to immigrate to a foreign country and you want to learn the foreign language of that country because you need it. That's right. the second. That's called the instrumental approach to learning. And of course, the third one is, sorry to say this, when you're forced to learn. Think of your K-12 schools or think of a sales course that your boss right. forces you to attend and whatnot. So the third type of learning is what we call mandatory or compulsory learning, which is the least efficient of all, by the way. In, in that order. So the first order was autotelic learning in terms of the level of uh, stimulation and in terms of effect efficiency of that learning. Because when you're learning autotelically, you actually learn at a very, very high uh, efficiency rate. Mm -hmm. The second best, of course, is when you learn for the sake of achieving certain results. And the third and the least efficient of all is when you're forced to learn something. And you can learn in all three cases, but of course, they all will act in a different way. And of course, you will have different levels of efficiencies in that type of learning. Very true. And um, my perspective on that is uh, you actually, your answer was very precise. Uh, and I'm going to add to that basically, sort of repeating it basically. And that is, okay, eventually you will have need, you will need some certain skills in life to, to survive merely. And those skills have to be learned at one point or the other. And as you progress, uh, progress in life, these the skills that you need uh, will will change or some other new ones be added some old ones might not be useful anymore so so you you're you're um, constantly in the process of learning uh, especially in now uh, in uh, in the world today and nowadays that the, the the speed of change is enormous it's um it's, it's much higher than we ever used to we ever had perhaps and a lot of people have trouble with that because they don't keep up with this uh, process of learning uh, necessarily um so so that that's one obvious reason why you will need to to learn w one that's of right. course as you mentioned you're forced because of your job requirements or whatever and eventually my favorite as you mentioned uh, you called it autotelic or rather the author of the book flow i have a hard time uh, uh, pronouncing his name oh yeah mihai chicks and mihai everybody Thank has you. the same problem but <laughs> literally i mispronounced his name for almost two years in all of my seminars until i finally learned a goddamn name i mean, love the guy but the name just literally it's difficult yes you know despite the fact that he talks about autotelic experience learning his name was not at all an auto experience. <laughs> like that. it was it was painful good point yes I, I i actually gave up a while ago i was like i'm just gonna say author of the, uh, the book uh, flow that's right everybody knows that if they know him they know what i'm talking about that's right for those listeners, it's mihai chick sent me high yeah um so anyhow that's my favorite um and i got the the notion consciously the first time through the same book that he wrote um the flow um <clears throat> excuse me and then the reason that's my favorite is obviously why you said and as we we discussed in the in that episode and back to school is learning for the sake of learning learning for the sake of the process learning for the sake of happiness and eventually 
pretty much every single person at some point in their lives or still are struggling with with happiness, the concept of happiness. How can I be happy, um, et cetera, et cetera. And if you if you can learn for the sake of learning, if you can do stuff for the sake of doing stuff and being immersed in them, then you will generate this state of flow, which eventually make you happy. And that's my favorite reason of all. And I have also a cancer argument. And that is, if I'm not doing that, what am I doing? So, so what's, well, if, if the, the question is, what's the point of learning? I'm, what's the point of anything? My answer is, and well, actually, you might as well learn. Uh, but in that regard, <laughs> when you say, what's the other point? You cannot not learn. I that's true. Earlier. Yeah, yeah. When you are well, not learning true. autotelically, then you're learning BS that you see on television. Very, very true. Or those few seconds of a glance at the ads that constantly pop up on your applications. So ultimately, you are learning Learning 24-7. Whether you like it or not, it's happening. And most of that learning is not good, especially if you don't have any conscious control over it. However, if you focus on that autotelic learning and learn the kind of things you want, then at least you will have control over your life. The other point you mentioned about learning for survival. Ultimately, we don't need to learn autotelically for survival because we are always learning anyways. What we need mainly is for two things, success and happiness. You see, uh, in life, happiness is what we seek. But happiness, unfortunately, is not uh, something we can achieve directly. Nobody can just reach directly to happiness. Happiness is the byproduct of what we call success. Mm -hmm. And we've already mentioned the term success many times in this podcast. And of course, we mentioned that it has different definitions. Each person has his own definition of success. And success isn't just about money or fame or whatever. It has a lot of definitions. For an artist, it could be just being able to paint very well. For a musician, just learning how to play the strokes properly and whatever. So ultimately, we need learning for succeeding in life. And once we succeed on our own terms... Maybe the society thinks to be a millionaire, you have to be a billionaire mm-hmm. or to have to be a trillionaire, and then you can actually uh, become, become successful. Yep. But in reality, for you, success is to help other people. Maybe for you, success means to uh, become a great athlete. Maybe it means to have the highest level of concentration when you're playing chess. It really doesn't matter. But ultimately, learning is first acquiring success and first being able to define success, because if you cannot define success, how can you be successful? And learning allows you to understand yourself and your desires. And those who learn more will then be able to easily define what it is that success means to them. And then it also allows them to take the right actions to achieve that success to acquire their happiness. So ultimately, learning, if you really want happiness, then you need success. And if you want success, you got to learn. So make sure this process for you is fun and enjoyable. And at the same time, know why you're doing this. Amazing. Yeah, that's the, that's the whole point. Like, um, again, the most enjoyable is the you know, autotelic meaning you, you learn for the sake of learning, you find your purpose, go for it and, and achieve what you want to achieve above all else. And um, yeah, that's 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 uh, my final take on it. My point is, why not? We all want to be happy. We all want to be successful. Normal people, at least. <laughs> But um, yeah, and uh, with that, we're approaching the. No one of us, man. They say animals have a survival and reproductive instinct. Right. But humans, in addition to those two, in addition to survival and re- reproductive instincts, we also have a success instinct. That's the third instinct. Because the human brain is made of three parts. It's made of the old brain, which is of which right. forms our instincts. It's the second layer is called the emotional brain, and animals have both of those as well. The instinctive part and the emotional part in animals are predominantly responsible for one thing and one thing, and that is ensuring your survival and reproduction. But we humans have a third part in our brain. It's called the prefrontal cortex. That's the most human, the most uh, recent addition. And in evolutionary terms, recent means probably millions of years, by the way. So don't (laughs) just, dude, man, I got a 2019 brain. So uh, the most recent brain after Neanderthals is the uh, prefrontal cortex. And that part has one instinct. It's called the success instinct. So in addition to survival and reproduction, we humans, all of us, if we're humans, we have this prefrontal cortex, and that part wants success. So that's the third instinct. And all of these three, survival, reproduction, and success, will require learning in order for them to be realized. Very true. And um, we can can do a whole episode on that, which is actually pretty cool. And we'll do it at some point. 
Um, but we are really running out of time, so we're going to have to conclude this um, this wonderful episode. And uh, with that, I'm going to ask you if you have any final comments. For sure, buddy. So understand, if you're listening to us right now, know that your life is a gift. We don't know how long we live. Maybe for a few days, maybe you got a few days or a few hours or a few seconds left. <gasps> don't die right now. Or maybe you have a few decades left. Maybe you have centuries. years ahead of you. We don't know. But don't we know, know one thing. Life is a gift. And every single day must be appreciated. And the best way to appreciate your life is to first understand it and then to make the most of it. And to do both, you need to learn. And if you want to improve your learning, understand that there are many ways to learn. If you didn't like learning in school, don't worry. You're not alone. There are many other ways to learn. Maybe you were a predominantly anesthetic learner and you were putting classes all the time and you got bored. So it doesn't matter. Discover what type of learning is your predominant form of learning uh, from a biological point of view and then focus on designing that one and make sure that your for you learning is an autotelic experience for the most part and not uh, mandatory or just because you have to use it. And this will give you a great chance at success and happiness in life. Very true. It's amazing how you put it. And um, eventually, um, happiness and success are going to, uh, sorry, uh, yes, uh, happiness and success are going to be byproduct of this process. So, um, but you have to first know what you want. That's that, as you put it, you have to define your success. What is your success? If you and that itself is a learning process, buddy. That's Just true. Defining who you are and what you want itself takes a lot of learning. It, everything literally is learning at this point. Yeah, it's just. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, it was a pleasure having you here, Dan, uh, again It today. is my pleasure, buddy. And having you here uh, with us listening, uh, like always, and hope to see you soon. I am Puya LJ, a.k.a. Pujix. Until later episodes, have a good evening.